uh, last Friday, um, Andrew did an excellent talk. It was very exciting, very ex inspiring. So, so here is just my uh, few thoughts after you know, really inspired by Andrew's talk. And uh, uh, you can see that you know, I have. Uh, I'm going to explain some of the ideas that uh, I I came up. Um, not all of them are fully baked, so uh, the purpose of this talk is just to um, contributing some some ideas for discussion. So, and uh, I would like to hear everybody's comments, feedback, and um, any you know suggestions uh, that possible directions we could explore further. Okay. Um, so uh, in Andrew's talk. Um, so I learned that you know we are gathering uh, actually data, a massive data actually from multimodal. So those are the three big uh, directions that Andrew pointed out. So I just released here those three uh, big uh, ideas, and then I'm going to talk uh, uh, what I have thought about within each uh, uh, within each category, and then some of the thought actually. Uh, go across um, two of those, so we'll you know see more like as we uh, as I'm moving on. So the first one is the uh, prioritize candidate disease genes from uh, association study. Um, so and in this domain, typically we're talking about actually not just a single SNPs and that are responsible for the uh, either the, uh, the the progression or the response or the outcome of the disease here we're talking about cardiovascular diseases typically there are multiple SNPs joint effort together with maybe environmental uh, stimuli and uh, and other things some hidden uh, confounding variables and uh, Andrew also talked about the importance of a, a biological pathway in, in this particular domain so which means that uh, Genes does not function independently from each other. Actually, they work together. Genes in the same biological function tend to respond in the in the uh, actually correlated way. We would say, and actually this picture actually I borrowed from another study for for the lung uh, lung disease. So just to illustrate the purpose that really uh, the observed genetic variants on the genome and the uh, Observed, like the gene expression, uh, is not really that one-to-one -one relationship. We could see that you know the, the association, but it really is a many-to-many -many relationship. It's quite complicated, and uh, so uh, in this domain, actually, in order, I mean, there's many, many computational methods that are developed to do the association study and has been demonstrated with many diseases, I think including cardiovascular diseases. Uh, so typically <clears throat> what people do is that they take those data, our mixed data, and then they do a run an association study model and then to correlate that with the disease outcome. And the lasso has been uh, one of the popular uh, method that people use, and uh, this, those are the like what I, I don't know if you can see uh, clearly on the on the screen. Those are the variations of a different lasso method. Basically, they are running some sort of uh, uh, regression model to fit the uh, uh, the parameters. So, uh, following Andrew's uh, idea. So basically, we should not just take those individual SNPs and the correlates that uh, maybe with uh, the disease outcome or other phenotypes that we care about, but rather look into the possibility of integrating them through the metabolic pathway. Uh, here, my my suggestion following that would be that actually there exists a multiple uh, knowledge bases. Uh, metabolic pathway is one of such, and then there's other possible things. Uh, knowledge base that people already established and actually what we can do we can uh, first uh, you know locate all of those relevant ones and uh, uh, to integrate this knowledge base into the association study all at once so build a big uh, a big model that that incorporate all of those what we call um, prior knowledge so that that can help us to confine our search space for biomarkers 
and also at the same time to help us to remove the noise in the data and also uh, remove the uh, maybe the uh, incomplete uh, actually the, the errors or false positives in those uh, knowledge base and uh, hopefully the result is that we'll do a better job in prioritizing the candidate genes okay so that's the idea so we could go beyond the um, uh, the space of metabolic pathway but uh, of course there are uh, okay, I'm going to talk about, before I talk about challenge, I, I was going to mention that there are quite a few challenges we want to do this that we need to uh, address in order to uh, integrate everything together. Um, the idea here is just moving from uh, univariate analysis to network science. Uh, in the past, uh, uh, most of the methods, especially for uh, if the data is of high high density markers, uh, so typically from uh, maybe generated from uh, DNA sequencing, so and then to associate that with the phenotype, typically uh, the method would be really just uh, do a sequential scan of the biomarkers and a sequential scan of the um, the the phenotype we care about, and then do all this pairwise evaluation to do to run statistical tests. Uh, maybe with the possibility of like you know permutation test or resampling based method to correct for uh, type one errors. So those are what I would call the univariate uh, analysis because it's really you know uh, we evaluate uh, the the <clears throat> effect of uh, uh, individual SNPs or even if we clump them like you know a few adjacent ones uh, into a into a, this, I mean the one that actually associated with the same gene and then together but still it's uh, we uh, isolate the effect of each one but the reality is that actually multiple genes or SNP uh, resided within the region of multiple genes may have a joint effect together with a group of phenotypes so we want to be able to capture this uh, effect and then to be able to model that with uh, uh, with a proper network setup like this is, a, I illustrated, this is really a, like drawing a graph, it's nodes represent uh, either SNPs or, or genes or proteins or other phenotypes and then edges uh, represent the observed correlation uh, of, the, of the value we read out of them. And then instead of doing pairwise individual association study, we can do groupwise uh, association study uh, through this setup. So, and uh, now we're going to the challenge because, I, as I mentioned before, all of this knowledge base, uh, you know, are not complete, right? So uh, we're still, you know, researchers are still building their uh, understanding and knowledge on those. And uh, sometimes you can see that oh, there's a few new discoveries, or maybe there's a uh, update of the existing. Uh, for example, uh, I, if we're talking about, for example, like, you know, protein-protein interaction, there's a lot of false positives, false negatives. And the metabolic pathway, there's uh, false negatives. And sometimes, you know, it, it's, you know, the people's belief would also change once they uh, see a little bit more evidence from other study. So we should, uh, the model should be able to overcome this should not completely rely on that, like if, uh, if uh, the knowledge base doesn't say certain things, then we completely don't think about it. That's, uh, that's not the best approach. We, we, what we want to do is to be able to integrate the knowledge and the data and see what's the common ground, and then use that to enrich each other. So that's what we hope to do. And the second thing is that, um, as I mentioned, the univariate analysis people are doing right now um, largely due to computational uh, burden because it's already take quite long if we do it the univariate analysis with uh, high density markers. And if we moving that towards network analysis, basically we consider the joint effect of uh, multiple things together and then there's no upper bound about how many things we, we join together to evaluate the effects. Then you can see that the combinatorial effect that really grow exponentially. And uh, how do we properly model that? 
with uh, so many variables that we measure, like sneaks and uh, gene expressions, protein expressions, phenotypes, and uh, so this is uh, really, you know, you can imagine we can set up a huge network. And uh, the evaluation uh, of and the inference of such network require a very careful design of the mathematical modeling as well as the algorithm and data structures. Um, Currently, that's still an open challenge that we could explore, but there's a lot of work. I actually have already built some foundation that we could leverage. And the third one is that um, from the uh, uh, Andrew's talk, I, I understand that uh, there are existing multiple uh, cohort of uh, cardiovascular disease, and um, and perhaps uh, the meta-analysis that combine all of them already being performed, and uh, issue or not issue, uh, uh, a potential challenge in such study would be the sample heterogeneity. And um, so again, that once we uh, want to combine more cohort, especially those patients do not exactly have the, the identical disease, and but have like relevant disease then we want to be able to carefully treat this heterogeneity. And uh, it's doable, but uh, that requires some careful design of the model. And uh, so far we have been talking about what's basically the association study typically identify the uh, potential correlation or observe the correlation in the data. So moving from correlation to causality is still a big step. So we hope we can sort of moving towards that uh, dual action uh, to some extent, um, supported by the by, by the data. So, so that's uh, some of the uh, open research issues that uh, uh, that could be explored under the big envelope. Uh, just to show some example about uh, the thought I had, um, for example, that if we want to integrate multiple uh, data source like the you know genetic variant like the gene expression like the protein expression and maybe together with like gene ontology and uh, metabolic pathway uh, each of these can be carefully modeled with a graph with a network and uh, so this chart just illustrate how do we integrate two of such networks and the high level idea is that there are some linkage between nodes in one network or vertex in one network versus vertex in the other network. In this particular example, in the top part, each of the vertex is actually a SNP. Uh, this, uh, and then from, uh, in, I think uh, this particular example is for a mice uh, study. And uh, so, and then the edge between, oh, sorry, <laughs> the edge between those basically are, are the observed uh, possible interactions or joint effect uh, between two SNPs. And this was uh, uh, collected through some you know, double knock, uh, knockout experiment uh, from another paper, actually. So, and um, the different type of that is basically in denote the different type of the, uh, uh, the effect. And then in the bottom ones, basically just uh, uh, correlation uh, between all the gene expressions. Okay, so if uh, two uh, the the expression of two genes are either positively or negatively correlated, and then you will see uh, an edge, and uh, the thickness of that edge just denote uh, the strength of such correlation, and um, you can see that uh, we could already uh, you know establish some connection there because of the you know, the location of such SNP versus the location of that G and all because of some other means. And then in this study, once we want to integrate that, um, we, uh, we want to learn basically a, a coefficient matrix that brings this thing together. The high level idea is that we want to be able to establish as much connection as possible as long as they're consistent with both networks. So basically, if there's an edge, the idea is that if there's an edge uh, in the top figure, right, we expect some sort of edge in the bottom one as well. Okay, so basically those modules we look at, we identified from the, the top figures, uh, top network should be consistent 
more or less with that one in the bottom one in some way, not in a strict fashion. So we want to look for that uh, that correlation with the existence of module, so that help us to learn this coefficient uh, matrix of W that tells us how those top ones and bottom ones should be integrated together. And then if we want to do uh, association study, like maybe expression quantitative locus analysis, and this association can help us to guide that study. To and as has been demonstrated, this can help us to uh, I filter out a lot of false positives and also identify uh, a better for uh, no, true positives and basically prioritize the candidate genome in a in a different way that match better with the accurate truth. That was showing in one study. And uh, so that, that was only showing between two networks. And then the idea can be generalized to multiple networks, as many as uh, possible. That's what we could do. So the basic idea is that you know uh, we can model within each domain, basically within each network, uh, the relationship, uh, observed relationship with the network. And then across pairs of networks, uh, we can establish those association with some weight factor there. And then we want to join all of them together, we want to establish uh, uh, as much consistency as possible, and then to use this to reinforce each other. Okay, in this way, it will help us to reach a, some kind of consensus understanding of the, the entire network space. So that's a high level idea. And I'm going to just ignore the technical details. And uh, so that was uh, within the first one. I think we should uh, actually, that's also related to what I'm going to talk about uh, between the, uh, to the second one, which is uh, mechanisms and the treatment for rare cardiovascular disease. So cardiovascular disease, my, my very limited understanding would be like it's just not one single disease actually is a, a class of, uh, uh, you know, sub, of maybe subclass of, uh, you know, a collection of those uh, uh, different uh, diseases, uh, I mean, subcategory belong to uh, cardiovascular disease. And uh, we can always either, you know, treat each and one wait. of those, uh, sorry, wait. yes? Wait, so the, the correct terminology is it's not a single gene or genetic defect. It's rarely that situation. Right. So, so cardiovascular diseases are multifactorial, multidimensional. Right. And multi mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So that's why we want to be able to model that. So um, a lot of the Wonderful. traditional association study have some limiting factor like how many of those you can look at at once. So uh, I'm just suggesting to sort of like push that envelope further, like to see how much we can integrate together. So for this, uh, I would propose that I think uh, um, uh, Andrew and, uh, and Pei Pei uh, talk about that uh, there's a rare cardiovascular disease and actually they're quite um, many of those. And uh, so we want to be able to uh, study those and um, the, well, like, you know, the mechanism and the treatment for those. Um, here are a few ideas including, for example, computational phenotype uh, under that envelope basically is really data-driven classification and uh, modeling of cardio cardiovascular disease. I look at the symptom and the known um, well, current understanding of the mechanism and also the current understanding of what, what should be the right treatment. And, uh, and also Andrew mentions the, uh, uh, the idea of doing drug reposition and also I saw like, you know, related to that, uh, we could also discover some adverse effect of, the, of certain drugs or a combination of drugs over the long term. And uh, the idea I would like to propose is, uh, um, so basically there are two uh, two dimensions of looking at things. One, the first one is uh, a multitask and a transfer learning to overcome the, uh, the limited sample size. Because for rare cardiovascular disease, if we want to look at uh, one given such uh, rare disease, perhaps the number of samples we get is limited. We don't get as many as we we wanted in theory. So, but we have uh, maybe have uh, many of those rare 
cardiovascular disease, and uh, for each of them we have some patient. And then we want to be able to leverage the, uh, the relevance between this. After all, they are you know, more closely or similar to each other than maybe to lung cancer or maybe to some other you know, very different diseases. So the idea of, uh, um, let me go to first on the, the multitask learning, I think uh, uh, the idea is to be able to, both of them is to want to leverage this similarity between these different rare uh, cardiovascular diseases so that we can combine all the sample together to be able to learn. So, uh, so we have a question in your previous yeah. slides. This is very nice, very clear. So I assume instead of study the disease network genes, we can study the disease network of metabolites or proteins. Right, right. Could, so, it, be, could it be an interaction of metabolites and proteins and genes? Yes, it's all possible. Like uh, if you have, for example, RNA sequencing for you know, measure the, uh, the genes, or, or transcripts, and then you could have um, metabolized, so you could have some other protein, like, you know, maybe from some other study, or you could have a, even a different measure or some, you know. So the hope is that we could uh, uh, combine all of them together. Awesome. That is true. So that, that's the idea, because uh, um, I gather, so like, you know, you know, big, right, what we, we could push the envelope. To, to create this unified space for cardiovascular disease. That's that's really great. That's really great. So, what is a BHAG? That's what uh, Andrew's uh, <laughs> Andrew's term. I think that's a uh, oh B yeah. In his slides, I see what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, that's what uh, I just copied that from Andrew's talk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Andrew, Andrew can, can, can answer that question with that Stanford, I think it's also. <laughs> okay. So, and uh, the, uh, the idea here, so uh, let me, uh, and then the second idea I want to talk about is to model the disease progress as a dynamic process, right? Because for uh, patients, we could have their uh, trajectory as, you know, time series. And then we want to be able to create the model like that. So and uh, so, which means what we think about the you know the the phenotype, uh, the the symptom or even treatment, the mechanism may be different at different stage. And as uh, you know, so we want to be able to dynamically capture if we have the right data. So um, so that's the second idea. I'm going to first talk about the first. Um, so this is some idea. This is actually someone's paper that I found. And to illustrate uh, the idea, and this was um, not done on uh, cardiovascular disease. There are, there are some other disease, I think, uh, they were looking at. They call this a uh, deep patient. So the idea here is to create, a, again, a, a space that integrates uh, all possible data. In this particular case, they look at all, all data from the uh, electronic health record. They didn't talk about uh, uh, integrate that with other, maybe omics data and other data, but we could do that. So um, the model, actually the idea applied to that. So what the idea is that for this multi-model data, uh, first we want to go through some, you know, machine learning algorithm. And this particular type they suggest is called the deep feature learning. The idea here is that with so much data, we want to first to know what should be the right collection of features that help us to describe all the variants we see in this data, okay? And we first learn what should be the features that we describe our patient. And this going through this uh, multiple many layers of a uh, uh, deep neural network is a, is a deep learning. So this is just cartoon on the right-hand side. And that's, through this, we can learn what's the set of features we can use to best describe our patient population in all dimensions, okay? So once they, we learned that, uh, we can create this um, huge matrix where each uh, each column is a feature that we just learned, and each row is is a patient. So basically, we can use a a quite long uh, feature vector to describe each patient. 
And then from that, we can apply again machine learning model to be able to, you know, making, you know, personalized uh, predictions, drug targeting, they mentioned that, you know, uh, disease prediction of the prediction of disease outcome. And uh, they also show in the paper that uh, they tried some, apply this to some, um, uh, some disease, and a patient of some disease in this table, I apologize for the low resolution, I do the, you know, screenshot of that. So the deep patient, the, the very um, last column, is their method compared to all uh, this uh, previous uh, method, PCA is principal component analysis, to do the feature transformation. That's a standard way of doing that. And then they said this uh, area and the ROC curve basically is as high as possible. That's uh, the higher, the better. And uh, maximum is one. So be, the number between zero and one basically tells you what's the space under the, there. So you can plot a curve between like how much first positive you allow and how versus how much you're for, well, sorry, what's the specificity versus what's the uh, sensitivity. So basically how much true positive you get versus how much true negative you get, something like that. There's a trade-off between that typically for most of the method when you turn the knob. And uh, so the area under that, the, the higher the better. So they demonstrate that in, the, in this way that you could reach somewhere between 84%, almost 85% to 97%. So this is only for the electronic health records that they, they did study. So, but I think the idea we can use similar idea, but then we broaden that to include all the other data sets uh, we have. And the deep learning does have the, you know, in theory, in the, the, uh, from the mathematical view, uh, models viewpoint, does have the capacity to incorporate all these other data types. Of course, it's to a computationally uh, intense, so we need like many, many hours of a cluster machine to train this model. But once it's trained, right, it's only need to, to be trained once, and then we can we can use that learn features to for you know for the subsequent analysis. So wait, this this is fascinating. I have a quick question. So mm -hmm. in this situation. Uh, do you think indeed it was true for every single disease and parameters they looked at? This new algorithm they've created called Deep Patient is performing better than PCA. Is there any way we could check if they are biased? Um, I don't know whether we can check that because if we, because they use the patient uh, data, right? It may not be public data. So, I, so, so it, but it, if we the, have the, something we can... The, the performance of our OC is that data set specific. Right, there could be data set specific and uh, they, they pick uh, um, less than 10, right? So it's like maybe eight or oh, exactly 10 disease and that's probably the one that they have a most patient. So for deep neural network, uh, one, requirement is that you have to have a lot of data to train it. So, um, but I think, uh, I think that like we could, uh, you know, explore that idea. We do not necessarily use deep neural network. We could, we can try it. And then there's other methods to derive features. Um, so one, one thing it is impressive from this particular data set versus all the other um, vascular data sets I looked with Carol is way they did follow the 76,000 patients for the entire year. Yes. That's not easy. Mm -hmm. Right. So that is unique. Maybe right. 76,000 is not giant number of cohorts, but that everyone's been followed for one year is pretty impressive. Right. So, so many of those studies actually really depend on the quality of the data uh, or whether we have them. Right, so if we have them, uh, we can think of uh, you know models to to leverage all, all the data we have. So, um, but I think we have more because they only look at the electronic health record, right? But we may have other data that we could incorporate, and uh, so I would imagine that we have more data type, and maybe we don't have as many patient as they are doing. But but this patient actually they. Uh, that's the total number of patients, but for each disease, they may not have as many. Right? On average, they have maybe 7,000 some, right? 
So, um, so PCA is a is one of the standard way to reduce the number of features, and it has been widely used. But uh, um, in 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 some cases, you know, if we carefully design a different feature selection method, I am not surprised that it will work better than PCA. And I've seen that in many other studies, not, not in the biomedical domain, but many other studies that demonstrate that a different uh, uh, feature selection method could work better. So um, we, we could also explore that space. I'm just throwing out the idea like through feature engineering, feature selection, we can create a, a space that can well describe our patient so that we can monitor the patients through that space and uh, for all uh, this, you know, you know, classification or prediction task. Fantastic, fantastic. So, so this is a, I, I specifically search for whether anybody have done for multitask learning or transfer learning for modeling rare disease. Uh, um, I will find, well, I did some, some search on Google. Um, this is one example, I think that people as I've seen, this is one of the maybe handful of papers I've seen using uh, multitask learning. So the idea here, a typical machine learning is a single task. Basically, you just uh, want to predict uh, one outcome. Let's see, one given disease, right? And uh, that's single task. And then if they have uh, multiple diseases they care about, then they treat each one, they learn, and they predict each one independently. So the multitask learning is to combine them together, and then, then you have a multiple outcome. But if this set of disease are relevant to each other, like maybe they are all cardiovascular disease, right? They may share some common sim symptoms, share some common mechanism at some point, okay? Then the model can capture that and leverage that. The, the idea here is that once we combine it right, and then the outcome, or the, if we talk about accuracy, for example, prediction accuracy, should be better than the model that you build for each individual one separately. Because they can this, this is amazing different. how you, sorry. This is amazing how you find this, really. But this particular paper is uh, talking, uh, is applied to Al Al Alzheimer disease, okay? Mm. And uh, I haven't found paper like, doing other disease. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, and then the, the idea of transfer learning is that uh, this is also Alzheimer's disease. Somehow in this space, people have tried this idea. Okay, and uh, so the idea here, so for each individual, I, say, I think even in the second paper especially, I forgot which one of those two papers, they mentioned that why do we want to do this is because for rare disease, a rare symptom that typically you don't have many patients. But, but then you have patients from uh, uh, related disease, very similar diseases. And then you want to, especially if we have like not just a rare cardiovascular disease, but some more common cardiovascular disease where we have more patients. But then between this common disease and the rare disease, you still share some of the mechanism and the, and the treatment and the symptom. Then the model can idea to borrow whatever we learned from this common disease to transfer the relevant knowledge to the study of the rare disease. To give you a simple idea, for example, for, for us, right, if we learn, learn a foreign language, right, if, let's see, I start to learn my first foreign language is English, I, I mean, it, it would take me, a reasonable person, uh, you know, whatever many years to learn English well, right? But once I learn my English, the next language may be a closely related one, maybe French or, or German, right? So you could imagine it would take me less time to learn that second language because these two languages are quite similar. Maybe they share some similarity in their grammar, in their vocabulary, and things like that. I could use, apply whatever I learn in the first foreign language to help me to study the second language, right? The time would be less than sort of learning these two languages independently. That's the idea. But of course, how much we can borrow from or transfer from one to the other 
depend on how similar these two things are. The more similar, the more we can transfer. If they are completely and indeed a completely different disease, then the outcome would look like, uh, you know, almost the same as you learn them separately. Okay, but it still doesn't hurt, right? Because there are some maybe mechanism hidden there that no one knows, but then the, the model can pick it up. So that's the idea, especially so, they said that uh, wait, 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 yes. from a, from just a physiology and pathophysiology point of view, um, for most of the cardiovascular rare disease case reports, just limited field that um, Travis helped me to, to review and go through in, in the past few days. What it really is, is there are a tiny fraction of the cardiovascular rare disease is because there is a unique gene mutation. Mm -hmm. And those are probably, I don't know, representing 10% or less of all the cardiovascular rare diseases. And the others, mm -hmm. the reason they're rare is exactly what you're saying. It bears certain symptoms and phenotypes of cardiovascular disease, but meantime, it really it bears symptoms and phenotypes of another common disease. So it's a combined mm -hmm. sort of phenotype. And so instead of to say that it is just cardiovascular disease, it really could be a consequent of another disease leading to cardiac failure, I or see. very rarely um, the situation with all the case reports is that they come from two or three main diseases, but all coincide in one person. And the discussion I had mm -hmm. with the others the other day is, if you examine diseases in a very carefully fashion in the cardiovascular cohorts, many of them have these rare issues because they also bear symptoms of another disease. So maybe right. at the end, it's not worth study a rare population. We mm -hmm. study a big population. It just every one of them is different. Right. So. So basically, uh, I, I, I mean, I, and I like what you just said, that basically we don't want to treat, I mean, just starting each patient in isolation, right? So uh, we want to really study that, all of that's them. That's exactly it. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. Yeah, right. so we would put that person with different symptoms if it can be not only from the cardiovascular, mm -hmm parameters and data we have, but also if the other symptoms and phenotypes are from a neuronal disease, right, that we right. could also mm -hmm. leverage knowledge from that disease. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, we could, you know, this, I mean, the model itself, like, can, you know, be used to study multiple diseases that, as, you know, as long as we identify there's some patient, right, also share some symptom like with, with these other diseases. We could always leverage the knowledge from these other diseases too, in, into this model. So that's the idea. So yeah. uh, here like I would like to, you know, that's why I call it multitasking, really not a single disease model. So we want to be able to model multiple disease together. So the second uh, idea is that uh, we want to, because if we have the look at the electronic health record, many of the patients we uh, document there, right? So either their testing, there's, uh, you know, progression of a disease over time course. We want to be able to also model this uh, disease progression as a dynamic process. And uh, I also um, did some literature research to see what people, you know, are, are thinking about. So. The, uh, this particular paper is a, is a generic paper, just talk about the ideas. Not, uh, I don't think they are specific to, to any particular disease. Just to say that you know, this is a, a way of uh, uh, looking at disease, rather than just the focus on certain snapshot right, of that, uh, that dynamic pr process. 
So this is a, a, a project for the low resolution because I, I this is one of the figure from that paper. Um, the idea to show the idea here is that uh, uh, basically once we you know derive the uh, model the uh, the patient population like with uh, like uh, a collection of features let's see and then we could model the temporal trajectory of each patient as a as a tr I mean the, the the curve like you would see that I mean, each dot here is a patient I think or a patient at a given particular time and then a given patient you can see there's a trajectory there and then what we can do is that instead of just looking that trajectory on the screen we could model it in this particular case they propose a, a hidden Markov model a variation of hidden Markov model to learn what are the hidden states right and of the disease hidden state they said that was what's observed in common between a group of patients and this could be the same as what the doctor classified or could be somewhat different but but whatever is suggested from the data. And I learned that the hidden state and the transition between them. So in this way, they could uh, uh, hope with the hope that, it, that, that they can better classify the patient, characterize what's the disease and symptom, progression or direction of the progression and treatment. So, and uh, in this way, they can have a better prediction of the future outcome of that, uh, that patient than the other message. That's what they claim. So that's the idea. And uh, I think this, if we have the, the right data, basically we have you know, many patients over somewhat long you know, uh, history, and then we could also build a similar model to incorporate that so that we can have a um, better index or feature derived for to, to characterize the patient. So that's uh, the uh, idea, and then we uh, actually that uh, Denver we show this uh, screenshot of uh, of a little prototype that uh, we have been building. This is in collaboration with uh, Corey in Alex uh, lab and uh, and the student. So it's called patient adaptive uh, retrieval and the summary engine, and this is ongoing work. And now we haven't uh, even have a one paper yet, so this is really at the starting stage. And um, so far, we have been focusing on mainly the clinical notes. And uh, so to basically summarize the clinical notes and uh, to, to help uh, the, the doctor to better, um, uh, better capture what's the major things with the patient. Because sometimes the clinical notes can be quite long. And uh, the doctor may not have the time to read it through very carefully and we want to first present uh, like an over, overall view of that patient so that it will help the doctor better uh, capture or re refresh the memory. So this is a screenshot and I think this particular screenshot is for breast cancer patient and on the right hand side uh, it would be the, the notes, part of the note you would see and uh, and the light green highlight would be uh, some of the symptoms that uh, the, they described by the patient. And uh, versus the middle panel, uh, these are, I think, I believe these are, there are some um, testing result. Oh, uh, sorry, it's the, uh, not testing result, it's really uh, what the patient complained was in this particular case is the pain and uh, how that changes over time. And um, but then with doing this, not like you know knowing that our pain would be one thing, and then and then we specifically just model the pain, but rather to using this topic modeling, we call it topic modeling, to derive what are the topics being discussed. So basically, what are the things being complained in this case, or the the things doctor described? What are the major things? And then to uh, to be able to derive over the time. Uh, how that changes in this parameter. So, so that's because this is ongoing. I only have this uh, um, screenshot because the, the student is at, still at summer intern. So, and uh, I think that um, we could uh, actually even go beyond from this, not just doing the clinical notes, but to really build a good patient representation. Uh, not just giving on a given uh, time point, but really over the course of the patient's record 
to be able to summarize and be able to link that maybe with the lab test, with other things, and also may if we have other known discoveries from maybe the omic study and other study, we, we can all link everything together so that to, to be able to uh, give a comprehensive view. At the same time, we can also, we do not just uh, uh, want to just look at one patient in isolation because maybe over a time course or maybe over a window that what the symptom uh, exhibit by the patient may be quite similar to a number of other patients. We want to be able to somehow link all this patient together based on the, the similarity, either like what their diagnosis or the symptom observed or the treatment or the outcome. So, and then by you know, a dynamic time range. We want to be able to uh, present that view as well. So yesterday we had uh, our engineering school have a strategic uh, planning meeting, and uh, uh, Steve, uh, Dr. Steve Dubnet was there, and he basically uh, expressed the importance of uh, not just uh, looking at each patient as just a one isolated individual, but really create a, this. Uh, uh, cohesive and uh, you know comprehensive uh, understanding of diseases and the patients as a whole. So, so basically, I think this is uh, more or less uh, uh, aligned a well with uh, whatever he said as well for for the UCLA uh, hospital. That's also what they would like to achieve. Um, so a little bit under the hood. The topic modeling, this is the standard method called latent derelict allocation. And the idea here is to model each hidden or unknown topic uh, with a description of a word. And uh, each, in this case, document or clinical notes or patient will be modeled as a probability distribution mm -hmm. over uh, this uh, topic space. And uh, so this both distribution that are to be learned including what are the topics and the description of the topics. Um, challenge we discovered is that um, the, if we just learn this blindly, then most likely the topic output it uh, in an unsupervised way does not necessarily coincide with the doctor's vision of how we want to describe things. So, and also, um, there are many synonyms or different ways to express the same thing. We want to be able to link that, and then we also want to be able to link to the right term terminology in the defined in the ontology. But typically in the clinical notes, people may or may not use that term, the, st the, the official term, but use some kind of a abbreviation or jargon to, the, you know, because that's meant to be communicated, uh, not uh, to the rest of the world, but between the doctors and nurse, and uh, so that. They are, you know, their clinical notes uh, can be quite noisy in that fashion. So that's why uh, in our study we actually leveraged, uh, you know, the uh, the mostly Wikipedia and other online forum to be able to link whatever the language that we observed in the clinical notes to the standard uh, uh, terminology uh, into that, combine them and uh, integrate that into the uh, LDA mode. That give us a much, much, much better result because this is still ongoing. So we're still exploring different ways of doing this. We have not got a chance to link with other things yet. We're pretty much focused on the clinical notes so far. So these are just a high level idea. And another idea of modeling the, the temporal course is that um, a typical, assume that we, we can observe a time series of different variables of, of the given patient. And then, of course, because they're patient, they suffer from some diseases, and then one or more of those measurements could look, you know, abnormal, right? And uh, here is that uh, we want to be able to track this uh, anomaly and, and go beyond the, the uh, correlation to see whether we can move towards the direction of identify the causality. So, uh, Assume that we can observe those measures over time course, and then we want to capture what we call the hidden detection, basically those unknown dependencies between those measurements and, uh, and other things. And uh, 
and then see if they are invariant if uh, in the normal people, right? And then if they are, we we'll want to capture them to see that in the patient when this invariant is broken, and then then and I correlate that observation with whatever the abnormally we observed of all this measurement, uh, with the hope that we can identify what is the main factor that contributing to all this uh, uh, anomaly and then to rank the proper cause and, you know, uh, with uh, some probability measure. So basically we can could identify, oh, it's maybe this particular uh, thing or maybe because of this patient have some mutation or because of uh, other things. So in this, with this model, we could also factor in some environmental effect as well. So that's the the idea that I just borrowed this uh, this figure from a uh, from a paper. So this is just once you model um, multiple anomalies, and then maybe only one or two of these are the original cause that triggers the anomaly of other observations. But we want to be able to localize that. So that's the idea. But again, that's we need to have the right data. Uh, the the time series data to support the, the study if we want to build this kind of model. This is just some throw out some ideas. So the third one is on um, um, knowledge uh, knowledge uh, network uh, based uh, drug reposition. And then this was the, the, the paper that Andrew put on and uh, with a possible collaboration saying that could be with uh, Dr. Zhao Wei Han. And uh, what I want to say is that this was, I think, published in 2011, and then su there are so many subsequent papers, and uh, that actually improve upon this. And one of these, I, I got another screenshot, and then of the paper. And uh, what I want to point out is this uh, Dr. Yi Jo Sun, uh, who was a PhD student of uh, of Zhao Wei Han. Uh, uh, she officially joined UCLA Computer Science Department in the Scalab. Uh, as of uh, June 30th of this year, so that will be a good collaboration point. Um, a little bit of this idea because I'm running out of time, so uh, here is basically taking an example from uh, study literatures because that's what they are mainly for uh, Dr. Ijo Sun and uh, Dr. Jia Wei Han, uh, types of mining. So basically the idea is to leverage all this you know, known uh, biomedical and concept and ontologies use that to help you to disambiguate different concepts because uh, the same acronym in this case RAS could mean different things. So in the context, they want to be able to leverage all the existing resources to be uh, basically disambiguated to know whenever RAS is said, like what it mean. It could be mean either a protein's name or a syndrome's name. So, so that's their idea. So that they can link all the concepts together and then to uh, properly assign the, the semantics and the type for those entities uh, through linkage study. And then um, going beyond that, uh, we could have uh, multiple those networks together and then, uh, I mean, create multiple networks. We want to be able to basically combine all of them together, this is, uh, you know, and then so that to this rely, uh, require us to, to, to develop a new scalable method for feature extraction, and then also uh, uh, the uh, a new method to basically, you know, uh, combine or integrate all this heterogeneous uh, uh, knowledge network uh, together so that for the career uh, cardio for the space of uh, cardiovascular diseases. So that's a big idea. Uh, the, the big picture that uh, uh, I would like to uh, to put forward to suggest. Uh, and but, but this is really inspired what what Andrew talked about uh, last Friday. So thank you. Uh, Wade, this is so awesome. This is so great. Uh, I just I mean as I said. Uh, to Andrew last week, uh, it was very stimulating and inspirational, and I, I thought it was so difficult to top his presentation last week, but I think you did it again. Um, 
you, you guys are doing amazing things uh, moving science forward. Uh, I'm very excited, Wei. I'm very stimulated in, in by many of the things you, you brought up today. Um, so I know Andrew had to run. Uh, I mm -hmm. was uh, hoping um, we could perhaps uh, save next Friday uh, to give uh, another round of discussion. Then we can mm -hmm. start brainstorm specific aims and of different opportunities uh, <coughs> for the next rounds of uh, awards that moving mm -hmm. us forward. Uh, I, I'm super excited about it. Um, I'm, I'm excited too because uh, I really, I'm, I'm really excited about the big picture Andrew talked about last time. So basic today I was just uh, think, well, if we want to realize that, what are on, on the technology side, right? <laughs> what we yes, could do? Platforms that you organize to present, yes. <coughs> This is really awesome. Um, anyone else has questions for Wei? I, I've interrupted you enough times <laughs> to ask questions. Any other questions for Wei? Um, you can always, you know, contact Wei later because I think we 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 have one minute left for this this hour. Yeah. So we'll talk again. I'm yes. going to try to get Carol to present a specific data and what's available with the MESA. It's a very um, actually well documented cardiovascular data sets. I'm going to ask her to, mm -hmm. to come on one of the Fridays to talk about it. Uh, but I think That's we are, of, yeah, we're, we're on schedule. We'll, we'll, we'll get, get something schedule. out soon. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. That's great. Well, thanks again, Wei. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity.